Please note that this content is for adults only. Viewer discretion advised. If you haven't yet, hit the subscribe, like and share. Hello everyone and welcome back to another live stream with me, Gisela K. This is Grizzly True Crime and today we're going to be talking about the Delphi case. We've talked a lot about this case all along the way <laughs> with all these, you know, things happening right before the trial. Of course now the trial is... I must get the exact d amount of days but it's really not far away. It's, it's set for May 13th. I mean... You know, by the time uh, Chad Daybell's trial is done, yeah, that one's starting. <laughs> it just feels like, like that's like a true crime calendar where you're like, whoa, by the time that was done, yeah, that one's starting. Oh my goodness. Welcome uh, to all my moderators. Thank you so much for everything you do. A very happy birthday to Pernil, who's here in chat. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for being here and happy birthday to you, Pernil. Uh, welcome to all my patrons all my members, subscribers, and everyone who's watching for the first time today, and you might consider subscribing. If you wouldn't mind, please like and share so that others know that we are live right now. Okay, so what I've done is, here's the problem. <laughs> there were two major hearings, and there's three important parts to discuss on March 18th of 2024, in this case. Now, we've been reading a lot of the documents and things, you know, building up to this hearing. And it is very important things that they discussed, but Judge Gold did not allow cameras in the courtroom. And on top of that, she also did not allow any audio recordings, and she said there will not be any transcripts. Why? <laughs> like, if she doesn't want this case to be, you know, tried in the media, if, if she doesn't want it to be this social media frenzy, if there shouldn't be leaks, and I'm not... Um, if the defense leaked information, that's a problem. I'm talking about in general, you know, like the state of the case. Then then you need to be transparent. <laughs> like it would solve so many problems. Do you know how many hours of stuff I had to listen to just to bring you a somewhat summary? I wasn't there in person. I wish I was, you know, because then I'd have my own crib notes, <laughs> you know, to read from and everything. But hearing, you know, from many people who were there, and listening to their long streams and notes and their thoughts and their observations is really great, you know? And many of them did a really good job. But there's sometimes like a little bit of, you know, because people see things differently. So there's a little bit of <laughs> differences, one could say inconsistencies, but it's not factually, it's just what they're seeing happen. For example, some people say Judge Gold was really snappy with the defense attorneys, like <laughs> really grumpy, right? While others say she was really professional this time. You know what I mean? Like, that's like, oh, wait, wait, which one is it? I don't know. I wish I was there. So, what I've done is, uh, I'm doing my best to bring you <laughs> a defluffed summary. From abroad, obviously, I'm not in Delphi. I'm sitting in Switzerland, right? So, I've listened to all these things, and I'm like, let's just summarize. What are the key takeaways for us? What do we need to know? Okay, like... What happened? What's the result? What's going to happen? So that's what I'm bringing you today, okay? To the very best of my ability. If there's anything that needs to be corrected, if anyone wants to reach out to me, my email is grizzlytruecrime at gmail.com. Or if you want to add more info or something, that would be great. If there's ever a list of what exactly happened and who was in what order, that would be amazing. But I just don't believe that this is going to happen in this courtroom. One would hope we get tran like transcripts and like a whole timeline of how the day went. But anyway... Let me bring up my presentation so that we can discuss it, okay? <laughs> so here we go. This is what I gather happened. So obviously there were no cameras in the courtroom, and so there were sketches made, as you can see. Yeah, this case in sketches, oh my goodness. This is the suspect, Richard M. Allen. He's 51 years old, and he was arrested in October of 2022. The case is about a double homicide that occurred in Delphi, Indiana, small town, 3,000 people living there, Libby German and Abby Williams, age 14 and age 13. Okay, and then we've got the defense attorneys, we've got Nicholas McClellan sketched on top there, he's the prosecutor. And if you look at the picture next to the girls, 
From the left, that's David Hennessy, big shot lawyer, who the defense attorneys have uh, hired, I guess, to consulted with to help them deal with all of these issues that's been going on in this case. Which is actually kind of separate to the case at this point. It's all the, you know, other stuff. It's like a second layer, in, in my opinion, right? Okay. <laughs> Jenna's like, it's 2024. Can we do away with the sketches? They, they like sketches in Delphi. Okay. Okay, so let's let's summarize a few things here. There was first, remember when last week we talked about all these motions? If you didn't see it, I hope you'll check it out. So when it, um sorry, I'm losing my train of thought there. Okay, we went through all the documents, right? And then I was saying, well, looks like the only thing that Judge Gold by Friday had replied to, all of that that she replied to was just, here's the um, court decorum order. And so that was it. And I'm like, is she really just going to be like, talk to the hand? I'm not even going to address the rest. Well, then on Sunday, because the date shows Sunday, many documents came out. And of course, everyone had them on Monday, like right before the hearing started. That must have been really stressful as well for everyone involved, wondering, well, are we still going to be there? Are we testifying? Is it going ahead or what's going to happen here, right? So let's first address Gull's response uh, to motions. All right. So Hennessy's verified motion for continuance was denied without hearing because remember, he wanted to delay it. Then she denied the motion to recuse the prosecutor from the hearing so that he could be called to testify. She also denied the motion to have the judge recuse herself in lieu of another judge. Judge Gold granted the state's motion, the state's motion to subpoena third party records from the Department of Corrections pertaining to Allen's, Richard Allen's medical and psychiatric health. The state will have 15 days to review those records. The defense asked for all upcoming hearings to be held in Carroll County instead of Allen County. Judge Gull agreed and said that any hearings, which is quite odd, <laughs> like David Hennessy apparently said, why is this always being held in Allen County and not Carroll County? You're a special judge, yes, from Allen County, but assigned to a case in Carroll County, so why are all the hearings here? She had no explanation for that, apparently, according to everyone who was there. That was solid from everyone saying it, and I'm like, whoa. So she just said, okay. She had no explanation for it, but she agreed that from now on, everything will happen in Carroll County. All hearings leading up to the trial, anything will be happening in Carroll County as it should have. Hello to Who's Your Cold Cases. It's nice to see you here. Thank you so much for being here. So then uh, Hennessy said that Gull should have appointed another special judge to oversee the contempt hearing, which uh, he said is required by law, and Gull noted this. So she just took note of it. She didn't deny it or grant it or do anything. She just took note. And then another one was... Um, where she said the court notes the filing by defendant of a motion to compel and request for sanctions on March 12th of 2024. Council claims to have attached Exhibit A to the pleading, but no exhibit has been provided. Council directed to either submit the exhibit or withdraw their motion. Man, <laughs> did you hate it when that happens? If you, this is now more important than just sending e an email. But you know when you say to someone, "All right, I'm attaching this and this for you," and then they <laughs> they reply and they're like, "Um, yeah, I know." You didn't attach anything. <laughs> well, I really wish they had attached that exhibit, right? Okay, hello. If there's any other content creators in chat or any locals, welcome, welcome. So if you didn't know, that's Judge Gold pictured on the right-hand side there. Okay. <laughs> I'm just reading some of your comments. <laughs> Please leave your comments below as well. Uh, so, Delphi murders case, March 18th hearings. Okay, there were two hearings which some people who took notes like truth and transparency my word those are detailed notes oh my goodness <laughs> so if you haven't if you want like all the details of who is wearing what and everything every detail possible truth and transparency like she's got it she took um i'm sure she knows shorthand because damn those notes <laughs> word i'm like oh my word that was I just can't believe like how how much detail there was, and then there's also there's a couple of content creators. Uh, Bob Mata was there as well, and he's been talking about everything as well. So apparently, okay, there were two hearings. That's what's reported, but there's like three important parts to these hearings. So we're going to discuss those. Firstly, the 9 a.m. one, 
was about Richard Allen's charges being amended and also the contemptuous conduct, you know, based on evidence leaks, which I'm hoping you know about because we've discussed a lot about all these things, right? Then at 2 p.m., something which actually started apparently at 3 p.m., they were running late, there was another hearing. And the purpose of this hearing was for Richard Allen's defense to provide an explanation through evidence and witnesses on why the case should be thrown out entirely. <laughs> okay. So also, thank you for uh, voting on the poll, everyone. I see you're all voting. I want to see what you say now. So though that's what happened there. Amended charges, contemptuous conduct, and then the dismissal of the case entirely. Three important things that we're going to break down, right? Now, in my poll, if you're watching live with us, I said, what do you believe should happen with Richard Allen right now? 39% uh, voted move him to jail, because if you didn't know, he's in a prison, he's not in a jail. Okay. Then 28% said, let him out on bail. 17% <laughs> said, keep him in prison, not jail, meaning keep him exactly where he is. And 17% said, set him free and drop all charges. Interesting results. <laughs> Francis, the DJ, says 70 days worth of jailhouse interviews erased. What? I know. If you missed those live streams, we talked about that last week as well. My goodness. Okay, so the trial date is set for May 13th of 2024. Bob Seagull, <laughs> which is not the same as Francis C. Gull, not like Judge Gull, this is a reporter with WTHR who gives lots of really great updates via X. And then we're also going to see a video clip of his as well because he was there in the courtroom. Okay. He said, today was the first time that we've seen Richard Allen in nearly nine months. He looked healthier than when we saw him last June. He was engaged and alert. And for the first time, I saw him smile once, something that did not seem in the realm of possibility last summer. Like... Can you believe <laughs> just the state of the case? There's no other case like this where it's like the defendant, the suspect is like, oh my word, he's smiling for once. <laughs> this is a very strange case. <laughs> so, okay. But it's good to hear they didn't show footage of him. You know, normally they show him like entering the courtroom, leaving the courtroom and, you know, and he's all shackled up and being carried out by like a fleet of security. Like so, so many people surrounding him. Wow, as if he's the most dangerous man on earth. But okay, this time we didn't see that. They just, just reports that he, and everybody said that, that everyone that I listened to, I tried to listen to literally everyone that was in the courtroom, okay? That's what they said. He looks much better, much healthier. Okay, so that's that's good. Then he'll make hopefully make it, yeah, yeah, to the trial, and hopefully it'll be a fair trial. Still wonder if there can be a fair trial with this judge. You know? Okay, so... Key takeaways. Richard Allen's charges were amended. Now, a lot of media is reporting that the two kidnapping charges were dropped. But all that really happened, it's not about it being dropped. Like, because some people started, like, getting excited that, oh, my word, they've dropped some charges. Not really. They, they tweaked it. They amended the charges. So he now faces two additional murder charges. The two kidnapping charges were dismissed by the state themselves. McClellan said that these charges more accurately aligns the charging information with the causes, the probable causes discovery, the causes discovery and the probable cause affidavit. And McClellan decided to dismiss those charges during Monday's hearing because the charges were filed beyond the statute of limitations, which is five years. So I just think it was almost like, like an admin adjustment. Like, let's uh, file this correctly and file the more appropriate charges according to what the evidence that they believe they have is so that they could present their case and have the best possibility, I'm talking about the state, for themselves to convict who they believe committed the crime. Okay, so, uh, where is that? It's still that um, committing murder while attempting to commit a kidnapping. It's that, we've read it before, there's a whole code for it. Okay, so we've gone over that before. Uh, MB Ing says, I've sent you the amended charge sheet. Oh, thank you so much. I'm looking. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you, Envy Inc. Live <laughs> sharing documents with me. Really appreciate that. I should have a look at that. Hold on one second, everyone. I would like to pull it up for us quickly, and then we're going to continue with our key takeaways. Where is it now? Is it this one? Yes. 
Okay. Let me just see how many pages it is. Okay, it's two pages. So we'll get back to that. We'll get back to that. Thank you, MB Inc. MB Inc is also a YouTuber. If you haven't checked his channel out, go check it out. He's always very helpful uh, for me to help me find documents and press conference links when I'm hunting those down. Yes, okay, so Bob, that's Nicholas McLean, the state prosecutor on the right hand side there, in case you didn't know. Bob Seagull said, Alan is now facing two additional murder charges. For I'm just showing you all the different wording so we get a full picture of what's going on here. He said, Alan is now facing two additional murder charges for the deaths of Abby and Libby. Uh, legal expert Katie Jackson Lindsay says that the new charges give the Carroll County prosecutor another avenue to convict Alan without, or to convict Alan would be the correct <laughs> emphasis, to convict him without having to prove that he's the one who actually killed the girls. One could look at this many ways. I'm almost like, well, can they prove that he was the one on the bridge? Is that flimsy for them? So therefore they're pursuing this? I don't know. I don't know what they have. The prosecutor also wanted to add two counts of kidnapping, but agreed today to abandon that request after conceding the charge falls outside of the five-year statute of limitations. Much of the day was spent on determining whether Allen's attorneys should be held in contempt. Prosecutor Nick McClellan called three investigators as witnesses, while all seemed credible, none made a slam dunk case tying Allen's attorney to intentionally leaking info. So apparently a lot of this day, not a lot of what was shared was slam dunk, but there were definitely some interesting points and outcomes, right? So far, so far, there's still gonna be more. Okay, I just quickly wanna say days until, sorry if it's loud, May 13th, 54 days until the trial today. My goodness. So, contemptuous conduct hearing. So we've already addressed now the amended charges, okay? Now we're on point two, contemptuous conduct hearing, and then we'll do the dismissal of the case. All right. The state prosecutor, McClelland, called their witnesses to the stand who were investigators. So he called his witnesses, of course, he's got co-counsel, Luttrell, I think is the guy's name. Okay, they called their witnesses to the stand who were investigators, including... Steve Mullen and Lieutenant Jerry Holman to discuss the leaks. Again, I'm just giving you the bullet points, okay? <laughs> McClellan claimed that the defense engaged in a prolonged campaign to leak case information to win public support. He focused on a defense, it's the same. We've gone over this many times. One would think that the Supreme Court of Indiana has dealt with this, but McClellan still harping on about it is how I see it as just from the outside looking in. He focused on a defense press release against the judge's gag order, emailing someone in error, the crime scene photo leaks, and communication uh, of defense strategies or case info to the leaker. Now, Judge Goh has given the defense, Hennessy and the defense attorneys, one week to file a brief with the court, which is kind of like a summary, like a closing argument summary from their side. The prosecution then has one week to respond. So, one week for them, then another week for McClellan to respond, and then Judge Gull has until May 1st to review both sides' arguments. Now, I just find that <laughs> that was the most shocking to me, and I had to check that like a hundred times just to make sure, because I'm like, but the trial is scheduled to start on May 13th. So if Judge Gull is like, okay, you take a week, then you take a week, and then I'll decide by May 1st. I mean, shouldn't they be focusing all the attention right now on just preparing for the trial and not dealing with all of this. Which is why many people don't believe that the trial is actually going to start on May 13th, but it's scheduled and the notices for the potential jury has been sent out. So it's on the calendar. So <laughs> I think we'll all be shocked if it does happen. I don't personally think there'll be cameras in the courtroom, but let's see. They haven't said. Okay. <laughs> Tammy Cox says, this is crazy. No, no, right. So I'm giving you, I know many of us are visual learners. I'm doing my best to give you bullet points and pictures so we could just picture because we were not there. Many of us were not there. Probably all of us, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Who's your cold case? says, you would, <laughs> you would think. I know, right? You would think. So Steve Mullen, who's the guy pictured on the top right, okay? We've seen him before. Remember if you've never seen the case file that I made for you, it's in the description box. It's a chronological summary. I put in all, you know, the press conferences in chronological order and the media briefings and 
interviews and things like that. So you've seen him before, okay? That's Steve Mullen. If you haven't, go check out the case file. Steve Mullen focused on Brandon Woodhouse, who's a guy from Delphi with a, or from Indiana, I don't know exactly where he stays, who has a YouTube channel. I've watched that guy's videos as well before. And apparently a tipster alerted the police that this Brandon Woodhouse had discovery leaks that he was sharing on his channel. So apparently what happened was, as we all know, I hope we know, but I'll remind you, Andrew Baldwin, one of the defense attorneys, was typing an email to um, Bradley Rosie, and then he wanted to send him the summary of the discovery. So it's, it's yeah, a summary. It doesn't have the details in. It's almost like chapters, right? And so he typed in, like, instead of Bradley Rosie, he typed in B-A-R or whatever, B-R-A, Brandon. Like, instead of Bradley, he typed Brandon and hit send. So it was like fast typing. Brandon Woodhouse was apparently one of his clients before, which is why he had his email address. So it kind of auto-filled and he sent. So that dude <laughs> had this summary of the discovery and then he decided to go on his YouTube channel and talk about it. Right, so Steve Mullen talked about that. Again, I'm giving you bullet points. Uh, Lieutenant Jerry Holman was called to the stand and he said that McClelland called him to inform him that he got a call from Becky Patty, who's Libby, German, one of the victim's grandmothers, right? So apparently McClelland got a call from Becky Patty to tell him that photos of her granddaughter's blood on a tree were being shared on social media. Now that breaks my heart. When family is calling the prosecutor, according to this, and saying, listen, now there's these horrible pictures being shared on social media. It's like social media frenzy. Remember the whole F tree and all of that, as they called it? I don't like that word. Like the F tree just sounds so weird. Well, okay, <laughs> you know, you know that whole, that whole thing. Okay, Suzanne, thank you so much. You said you do, you do a fantastic job. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. So, man, I'm just devastated for the families having to experience that and see this type of like social media frenzy and the sharing of photos and how that grew, and then how people started feeling like, I don't know, it just seemed like it, like special for having the photos. Some even pretended to have the photos. And now we know that, especially from what uh, Todd Click testified to. Just like all the things he said, apparently, you know, debunks what some people who were saying they saw the photos and this and this. No, no, no. You can kind of hear who saw it and who didn't. You know what I mean? But, oh, man. So, that was in October of 2023. And then the, the Murder Sheet podcast then called Jerry Holman to alert him that crime scene photos had leaked and not just the tree photo. So we've gone over an entire document of that and how they said that they printed out some of the pictures and, you know, I've listened to some of the episodes. I'm not a fan and I don't think they're a fan of me either. And that's okay. We could all, <laughs> all different opinions, <laughs> but it's, it's a lot. Rather listen to all the episodes yourself and go over the documents that we went over again, watch the replay because it's, it's just, it's a rabbit hole. So right now I'm trying to just do the the bullet points. Lieutenant Holman explained how photos were redacted. This one is a rabbit hole and I've only just walked around it. <laughs> that diving in feels like, are we ever going to get out of that? Because <laughs> Lieutenant Holman explained how they redact photos. They redacted in little squares apparently and then on some of these photos that were leaked there were little circles to redact some of the, you know, graphic stuff, let's say like that. And so some are claiming that this squares versus circles redaction proves that the leak came from the defense, while others are saying it proves that it came either from the murder sheet or from the prosecution, which some people accuse them. You know how people are accusing some YouTubers for working with the defense, other people accuse the murder sheet for working with the prosecution and it's a whole thing, which is also very unique in this case. This case is very unique in how much Social media is involved, YouTubers and podcasters. It's, that's quite strange. I've never seen that. I don't think I really want to see it again. <laughs> you know, I think there's a place for like commentary and social media and then like getting into the case is just like, that's a little bit scary. I wish the judge, I think we all wish that had more of a solid grip on what is going on here. Because I don't know, the trial we just watched together, Daniel Howard, I just can't imagine that a judge like that would allow all of this to happen. You know, so I don't know. I don't know what it proves. I have no idea. I'm not even going to speculate what it proves <laughs> because who knows? And it was just brought up, right? 
So they, they talked a lot about the leaks and everything. And this is, of course, why they're talking about it. Just to remind you, this is about the contemptuous conduct allegations where Nicholas McClellan, the state prosecutor, is saying the defense has this contempt of court conduct, that they caused all these leaks. And so it's almost like playing fire with fire, but it's feeling very playgroundish from both sides now. It just feels like, oh, you leaked it. And then the defense is like, no, you did. And we're going to bring up all these YouTubers and podcasters to tell you that you did it. And I'm like, oh, no. Like, what is going on here? It just it doesn't feel... <laughs> Contrast it, and it just feels like out of control, chaotic and childish. It just that's what it feels like at this moment. Now, Bob uh, Siegel said, while the prosecutor's case was not airtight, the defense's presentation today was a downright mess. <laughs> I like the way he just summarizes things. Like this was a downright mess. Attorney David Hennessy chose to focus on YouTuber and internet sleuth uh, testimonies rather than poke holes in the prosecution's arguments. That didn't fly with the judge. There was also a YouTuber that was kicked out of the courtroom because him and another YouTuber got into some kind of like fight. You could just hear Barney, Barney, which is <laughs> just like, what is happening? So they, they were kicked out and apparently they are permanently, um, I don't know if I want to use it, banned sounds like a strong word, but permanently not allowed to be part of, you know, the, the courtroom proceedings. Wow. Stefan says, McLean complained about having no resources for that trial, but has nothing else to do than filing ridiculous motions. I know. It's very much like, he said it, no, he said it, no, this one. And sometimes you hear YouTubers argue like that with each other about this case. I've heard that. That's always like, oh my word, we're in the sand pit now and we are arguing. You did it, no, you did it, no, you did it. But now when you see this happening between the defense and the prosecutor and then the judge is uh, all snappy. <laughs> I don't know, man. So Seagull said the judge sustained nearly every objection to strike defense witnesses' testimony based on irrelevance and scolded Hennessy by stating that he couldn't substantiate or support many of his claims and statements. Hennessy did score points in defense of Rosie and Baldwin by clarifying that the press release timeline before the gag order, we've gone over all of that, and reminding the judge that willful, intentional disobedience is needed to find contempt. So that was apparently... You know, he brought that point home that this wasn't willful. It wasn't intentional. The email was a mistake. The leaker dude, you know, was a friend that broke trust or whatever. All of that, right? Who's your call case? says, what? No, that never happens. <laughs> so uh, he also said the contempt hearing underscored the bad blood that remains between Judge Gold and the Delphi defense attorneys. While I truly think that the judge tried to be patient, her general demeanor during the hearings was one of disgust and impatience for the defense requests and arguments, which of course we, we've we seen that from a mile away. Even if there's no cameras, I can imagine that because of what we've seen so far, right? Again, the disgust might be warranted based on today's defense strategy and line of questioning, but not likely to convince anyone of her impartiality. That's the problem. Following claims of bias by the defense, her temper was on display throughout the hearings and directed only at the defense. The bias is showing again. Judge calls bias, and you don't want a judge that's biased, of course not. You want a fair trial, someone like the judge we just saw. But Berez, is that how you say it? I can't remember how to say his name, but the judge we just saw, I know how to spell it. I could see how to spell it. Um, in the Daniel Howard trial, so calm, so professional, not biased, fair to both sides. Some people would say he went easy, you know, on the defense there with the whole escape thing that we watched. But, you know. I just wish for something like that. Man, in this case, I just wish for a professional judge that's not biased. Because this case really needs it. With all this mess and chaos, yeah, yeah, it needs that. So Bob Siegel said, uh, Gull snapped at Hennessy for asking the judge to repeat herself. But apparently he's got some hearing problems. He's a senior. And she, got, she snapped at him for asking her to repeat herself. Repeatedly told him to stop interrupting her and admonished him for an inappropriate comment toward the prosecutor. Her admonishments often seemed justified. The condescending tone was not. And that's part of what I find interesting, that this reporter, uh, Bob Siegel, is saying that, and actually there's another lady as well, reporter, that said the same, that was there from WTHR, that Ju Judge Gall was snappy and seemed biased, and there was this anger issue at the do thing, she's got like some kind of, I'm speculating, but it seems like these anger issues sometimes, you know? And I know the situation is incredibly frustrating, but it's the judge's job to remain 
come and actually judge, like rule on, have control of your courtroom, right? Okay, so Jennifer Fox says the man is deaf. Shame. So then how could she be snappy if you can't hear her and say, sorry, can you repeat yourself? Can you repeat yourself? Like, that's just, that's just not nice, right? Okay, so still, this has still got to do with the contemptuous conduct and the leaks. Just to keep, I'm just keep reminding you where we are, right? Yes, thank you, Mbink. If anyone's confused, uh, Bob Siegel works for WTHR Channel 13. Yes, we're going to look at a clip of his as well. So, Rosie took the stand in his own defense and pointed out how the leaked evidence timeline went and included that they were surprised to see case details shared by a court TV commentator, which they'd only just, with details that they'd only just learned about themselves. So, I don't know if they talk about the Chris Todd guy or Barbara... I don't know, Barbara McDonald, I'm not sure what they, but I just feel like the argument, is it a strong argument? I'm not sure. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the defense brought in witnesses, including three attorneys and content creators. Steve Wood is someone who's on YouTube, and on YouTube he goes as Skip Jansen, and he testified that another YouTuber that he had conversations with appeared to have information from the then unreleased probable cause affidavit. That there, they, I'm just helping us understand because otherwise we're gonna be like who, what, where. That because we we read the documents last week. That's Fig Solves, who deleted his channel, or I don't know if his channel got deleted. I don't know. He's everything is gone of his channel. But Fig Solves was accused of working with the prosecution and sharing information, and then telling people on YouTube that, uh, that we're gonna hear a lot about a bullet or an unspent round, and then the PCA came out and all of that. So who knows if it's a case of a YouTuber saying that they have stuff and connections that they don't really have, you know, like kind of embellishing. I don't know. It's either that or is there merit to it? Who knows? <laughs> you know, that's what I'm saying. That also, Bob Siegel, who was there and reporting on with this uh, post that I showed you, was just saying this, this is no slam dunk on this day. It's just a lot of kind of what we have already heard, right? So... um. Apparently, the three attorneys were very professional, and they were also bringing home the point that the judge would have to prove that this was, like, willful disobedience, that they intentionally did this, the defense team. So, uh, when asked who allegedly gave that YouTuber information, Steve Wood, who goes by Skip Jansen on YouTube, uh, said uh, that it was reportedly coming from McClelland. This caused McClellan to object uh, object to the defense's arguments. I can just imagine. <laughs> he must have been so mad, stomping his foot and stating that Hennessy was just trying to parade a bunch of YouTubers and podcasters who knew nothing about the leak up to the witness stand. Again, that's where I'm like, I don't know if that's a good strategy. I don't know if the strategy was, again, to, like, you know, gain some public favor of some sorts, or appeal to the public in some way, but I don't think it went very well. <laughs> you know, and apparently some of the YouTubers and uh, activists that they called up, they found within five minutes that their testimony would be irrelevant, so they were on for five minutes and then dismissed, which kind of sucks if they had a whole lineup of people, but they were just like one by one, like, no, 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 this got nothing to do with what we're talking about, so off you go. Um, McClellan also said if the shoe was on the other foot, the defense would be screaming from the mountaintop. Okay, so now he's screaming from the mountaintop. Okay. <laughs> now, we've gone over the amended charges, hearings, the motions, the amended charges hearings, and then the contemptuous conduct hearing. Then there was a lunch break, and then at around 3 p.m., this dismissal of all the charges hearing started according to what people are saying who were there. <laughs> I was not there, remember, and I'm not an attorney. We're just bullet pointing. So, the defense wants to have the case completely thrown out, highlighting the lost interviews, which I know we're all shocked as well. Like, how could they lose 70 days worth of interviews? That is shocking. Yes, indeed. It's pretty botched, and the initial stages of the investigation, it sounds pretty disappointing. They dropped the ball, in my opinion. So now what? You know? Now what? <laughs> so... Did they pick it, the, the ball back up? And is it Richard Allen? Is he the suspect? He's the suspect right now. I know everybody's like, you know, on one side or the other. <laughs> we'll have to see because the trial is only 54 days away. We'll have to see what happens. So attorney Baldwin questioned a former Rushville police officer. 
Todd Click. Now, this was very important. And if you've ever read the Frank's memorandum, that 136 page document, which I've also done a summary like this for you on, we didn't actually read through the whole thing at that stage because they made it private. It wasn't sealed. It was just made private, which was confusing at the time. But I just made a presentation out of all of that. Um, so if you've never seen that, go check it out. Todd Click was mentioned in there because he's one of the initial investigators who took the Odinist angle of investigating the case because he thought that what he saw at the from the crime scene could be along those lines, right? So Todd Click was probably the main witness for the day. You know, this was like, whoa, it's got everyone's attention because he said there were several persons of interest in the initial stages of the investigation that were never followed up with. So that's dropping the ball, right? And everything that I've just heard from everyone's notes that were there that he said is very interesting and also very concerning. And it kind of goes with the gut feel that many of us have of law enforcement <laughs> dropping the ball in the early stages. And we know how important, how critical the early stages of an investigation is. So to lose between February... 17th and 20th, those interviews with some of these guys that are persons of interest, according to the defense, those guys, the Odinist dudes, right? To lose all of those interviews is just, or to lose the audio of some of them. Yeah, it's a bit of a red flag, right? Uh, Gigi says, I've been a loco for a year. <laughs> thank you for saying hi. You said, thank you, Mama G, for creating a safe space for us all. I appreciate your dedication. You are cut from a different cloth and they don't make that fabric anymore. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Okay, so Mrs. Melissa said, there are so many people in this case to feel sorry for. The only thing that has saved the uh, county is the gag order that's in place. Poor families. Sure. Uh, sure, this, wow, this case. So Todd Click said that there were several persons of interest in the initial stages of the investigation that were never followed up with. He allegedly still believes, I say allegedly because it's based on people who are in the courtroom and that's what they interpret from it, right? He allegedly still believes the Odinism angle is the correct one to pursue according to those who are listening in. Click testified about a Johnny Messer who's this guy. The one on the top right, that's apparently Todd Click. When I researched him, that's what I find. Lots of photos of him, won lots of, uh, of awards and everything as well. So a good, thorough uh, cop investigator, right? MB Inc. says, Todd Click seems to be one of the few investigators who is credible. True, as well, which is why everybody's now paying attention to what he said, which is why I find it interesting that Judge Gull is not allowing audio transcripts. I know people say, people have said, attorneys have said, but it's not legal to not have transcripts, but we know there's issues with transcripts in this case already. <laughs> the defense is asking for three other hearings that they've had before for the transcripts, and they're just not getting it. When the Indiana Supreme Court stepped in, they said to Judge Gull, you have to give the transcripts of that in chambers. Remember that in chambers showdown, if I can call it that, in this Delphi debacle. Yes, we, we got to see some of those, but the others we haven't. And here, um, Bob Mata posted on, who is a defense attorney, former defense attorney. He's now on his channel, um, Defense Diaries Podcast, right? He said that Judge Gull saying, no audio, no transcript, <laughs> like that is the problem. And I do find that very concerning because one, I would really hope that would be like, like I'm a nerd and I would love to see those. That would help so much with all the summaries. So you don't have to rely on hearsay because essentially that's what this all is. Now we all have to rely on hearsay based on what people saw and heard when they were there. That, is that what they want? Don't you just want to provide transcripts so that everybody could just see exactly what was said and not speculate? My goodness. So yeah, I had to go through this entire, and sorry for the word, but shitstorm, <laughs> as I call it, it's the only thing I can imagine calling it, whole shitstorm of like so much stuff and then try my best to defluff that and be like, let's just see, what do we need to know from this? So this Todd Click testified about Johnny Messer, who was one of the guys mentioned as one of the five Odinist guys, right? He testified about Johnny Messer, uh, and Vin Vinlanders and Odinus and said that he found evidence of Messer kidnapping an individual at gunpoint. This was apparently a drug deal gone bad. Now, unfortunately, which is why I say it's, it's dangerous when it's hearsay, is it got a little bit misconstrued and misreported and then people ran with it and 
you know, it wasn't a girl captured at gunpoint. It was an individual. And it's apparently this drug deal gone bad. But what's interesting about it, because of course one might ask, why is this relevant? What does this have to do with the dismissal of charges? Is because Todd Click is saying, well, it goes to show that the investigators dropped the ball. <laughs> like they didn't even look at that. When he had a probable cause affidavit um, drawn up for a situation like that, they didn't even look into it, you know, about that concerning footage supposedly on one of their phones where they kidnapping a guy. Apparently it was a male, but just an individual at gunpoint. Anyway, so as you can see, it's a rabbit hole. We're trying to stay just out of it. He apparently thinks that the probable cause affidavit lacks compelling evidence and was surprised when Richard Allen was arrested, especially based on everything that he investigated and everything that he knows. So imagine if he is one of the only credible, thorough, very hardworking investigators. You know, why would they not want to hear him out? Meaning the other investigators. <laughs> you know, don't you want to hear what he has to say? Or Anyway, so... The defense apparently, now that's what's interesting, the defense apparently now have the phone of Messer's friend, Elvis Fields, and Elvis Fields' girlfriend. So whose phone do they have? Elvis Fields' girlfriend or ex-girlfriend or wife. I'm not sure what the status of that relationship is. People online are saying baby mama. I don't know. I do not know. But apparently they've got her phone and Celebrite, which we know will extract data from the phone i don't know is it a desperate move from the defense or is it plausible imagine <laughs> imagine if it comes out of the trial if they have these types of guys on the stand like especially elvis fields who we've heard about he's the one that said that if i if you find my spit on one of the girls and i can explain it away am i still in trouble and he confessed to his sisters that he was there when other guys were committing the murders and that he said that they put sticks on Abby's head because she was a troublemaker. All of this is in that Frank's memorandum. And so apparently during this testimony, I really wish I was sitting there to hear this. It sounds very interesting. Apparently he was saying they proved connections between Messer. This is a mugshot, by the way. That's why I put it there. It's not like I dug out a picture I'm not supposed to show. It's a mugshot for other crimes, drug-related crimes, okay? So showing a connection between Brad Holder, Johnny Messer, that Patrick Westfall, Elvis Fields, and all of this. <laughs> it's a lot. It sounds interesting to look into, for sure. I wish the investigators did, or do, especially just to eliminate, right? Uh, Maria, I think that also, uh, firstly, one thing at a time. Maria, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I think that's also what's such a concern, is that it from the outside looking in, seems like investigators are like, nah. And then with this, what we perceive as weak evidence, they, against Richard Allen, they're like, yeah, Richard Allen is our guy. It doesn't make people feel confident in the investigation, in the case. So I just think no one is making us feel confident in this case right now. Not the judge, not the prosecutor, not the investigators, and maybe not even the defense attorneys because of all the messes that they've already made. But... They're the ones with this, like, energy of determination and fight. And you know what I mean? So I think that's why it's also like, okay, okay, we could trust them a little bit, <laughs> right? Because this point, it just seems like, oh my goodness, what is going on here? So yes, as you can see, that is all a rabbit hole that you can absolutely go into. And many people are going into it. I don't know if I'm ready. <laughs> Especially because I wasn't there. It will be hearsay and then I'm diving in and I'm like, what are we coming out with? What is going on here? So dismissal of charges hearing continued. The afternoon one, it's just a second slide. McClellan called the chief of Delphi Police Department from 2017, Steve Mullen. So he was also there in the afternoon session. Okay. He now works for the Carroll County Prosecutor's Office. Which, is that a good thing? I don't know. <laughs> Mullins explained that the DVD used in the police interview room was left on and recording for months. When it filled the large hard drive, it recorded over the police interviews with possible suspects in the days immediately after the killing. So he's trying to explain how did 70 days of police interviews get lost and 
how do you not how do you not know who you interviewed because there was also not a record kept of who they even interviewed in those 70 days the defense says because investigators lost potentially exculpatory evidence the charges against richard allen should be should be dismissed you know and i'd love to hear your thoughts on that leave me a comment especially below after this live stream because i can't always see everyone's comments in the live chat even though i'm glancing there as much as i can and i do watch the live chat replay but comments i would love to see especially if you're watching the replay okay so special judge francis gull took the arguments and counter arguments under advisement and will rule at a later date on allen's motion to dismiss charges well we can imagine how that's going to go <laughs> any guesses how it's going to go okay so the trial is scheduled to take place from may 13th to may 31st jury selection starts on may 13th jurors will be selected from allen county the trial will be held in carroll county jury selection questionnaires were sent out in allen county on march 14th the jury selection will happen on the first day of the trial as i say which is currently set for may 13th so you've heard it there like three times over so we know right <laughs> stefan's like later date is two days before the trial some people are also speculating that Judge Gohl has set up a unique set of legal circumstances in which she could actually arrest the defense attorneys when she makes her decision there around May 1st. So <laughs> I hope that doesn't happen. Can they just, can they be, can they be a trial? Can it be a fair trial? Big question, question of every day that we talk about this case. Because without a fair trial, it can't be justice. For Libby and Abby, you know. So I'm just showing you some pictures here that you know that I found on an article that said, uh, you know, not commonly seen pictures or whatever. Maybe you've seen them all. Some of these I hadn't actually seen before. So, and if you didn't know who the victims in this case are, Libby, Abby, Libby was 14 and Abby was 13. My goodness! And they just went out for a walk on a day that they had off from school, February. 17th of oh, sorry february 13th of 2017 it's just this this case is unbelievable and remember the former prosecutor robert ives he was saying based on everything he knew about the crime scene and everything he saw he was like i thought this case would be solved in two days you know like they, they're gonna find the person and that's it based on all the evidence at the scene which just sound if you ever listen, re-listen to the Down the Hill podcast and the interview with Robert Ives, it's very interesting to hear all the things he said. I think he's also on Oxygen. He's all over the place. So that's an interesting one to listen to, just to go over. I thought you had so much evidence, though. So what was going on here? Recording over interviews. That's a big problem. Then re-interview, right? The minute you realize that you've recorded over all the interviews, whoa, okay. Fix that and record everyone again. Even though it won't be... <laughs> Um, the same. Gerda says, <laughs> this whole case is yo, yo, yo. Yeah, that's a South African saying. It's all yo, yo, yo. Now, I'm going to show you a clip, then I'm going to show you that document. So just hang on one second. Uh, we want to look, I'm going to boost it first. And let's look at this clip here, because it's a good summary of everything you just heard from Bob Siegel, who I've quoted a lot here today. Okay, so here we go. Let's put the sound on for you. Well, what what a strange day, an unusual day here at the Allen County Courthouse. It was actually the defense attorneys, Andrew Baldwin and Brad Rosie, who were on trial, essentially having to explain to a judge why they should not be held in contempt for allegedly violating court orders. Carroll County Prosecutor Nick McLeland asked for the charges, accusing the attorneys of violating a gag order imposed by the judge and leaking crime scene photos and information about the case. He presented evidence from investigators that traced a leak of evidence to the office of Andrew Baldwin. But the attorney representing Baldwin and Rosie said there was absolutely nothing willful and intentional about any of the leaks. And he said, according to the law, without willful and intentional disobedience beyond a reasonable doubt, there can be no finding of contempt. Today's hearing was, for lack of a better word, ugly. The prosecutor did not present strong evidence to support his allegations. The defense team called witnesses that seemingly had little relevance to the proceedings. And the judge repeatedly snapped at the defense team and seemed to lose patience with their line of questioning. 
So right now the judge is giving the defense team an extra week to file their uh, really final arguments and then the prosecutor will have a week after that. So as far as a decision on the contempt, we won't get that probably until sometime next month. What we did get today was an extra hearing that we were not expecting. That hearing is whether to dismiss charges against Richard Allen. The defense team says the charges should be dismissed because they claim that the state has really been withholding, hiding information that could be helpful to Richard Allen. We weren't expecting that hearing. It got added in here middle of the afternoon. My colleague Emily Longnecker is in that hearing. It's still going. See, even that. We weren't expecting that hearing. It just got added in here in the middle of the afternoon. Why do things like that happen in Delphi? It's like literally only there. Why? Why? <laughs> you know, just suddenly, just, just, just quickly put this other hearing in here. I mean, that's what I say. The judge really needs to take control of her freaking courtroom, even though it's not her courtroom. Well, they were in Ellen County, but you know what I mean? Like, make sure you know what you're going to be discussing before the day. Because like, oh, we didn't expect that. Here we go. Here's another one. Uh, MBN says, hope the Unified Command have not lost the Hoosier Harvestor footage. Why? Oh, man. Okay, whoa. Careful. Don't go down that rabbit hole. I'm telling myself now. The Hoosier Harvestor footage. Why, when they were looking for the bridge guy, and they were talking about, if anyone saw a vehicle parked at the old CPS building... Okay, you didn't give a make, a model, a color, nothing. How is the public supposed to help you? What what the hell kind of plea was that? And, as we see in many other cases, why don't you show us the footage? <laughs> or why don't you have the footage? Or why don't you show footage of who drove past that day? I mean, way back then, like seven years ago, right? Oh my goodness, okay. Going on right now, we hope to have more information on what is decided on that coming up at 6. Live okay. in Fort Wayne, I'm Bob Siegel, 13 News. Thanks, Bob. We'll look forward to that report at 6. In the meantime, you mentioned that Richard Allen was there today in court in Allen County. How, how was he? Yeah, we have not actually seen Richard Allen for nine months. Today was the first day we had seen him. And I'll tell you, he looked much better than the last time that we saw him in court. Um, the last time we saw him in court, he looked really pretty dazed and, and out of it today. He was actually engaged in the proceedings, at least at the beginning. I think as it wore on, I think everyone got a, a little bit tired as, as things dragged on, and Richard Allen did too, but he seemed to be in better health. He seemed to be uh, more aware of what was going on around him. At one point, I saw him look at his wife, and it's the first time since he's been charged that I saw him smile in court. So he was uh, definitely different demeanor today. Of course, the victim's families were in court as well. Um, everyone was admonished by the judge not to say anything. At one point, she snapped, hey, be quiet, uh, as soon as she walked into the courtroom. So we're not really allowed to... <laughs> He's not impressed with snappy judge. Stefan says, I remember your slide with a Lamborghini, did you? Yeah, because I was like, at that point, when we were going over that, like, what did they want us to look for? You know, what must we share? Because, you know, I like to make presentations, share flyers, share all the information, call this number... This is what they look for, this car, this, whatever it is. Like, oh, if someone was parked there, or if you know of someone who was parked there, yes, let us know. And I'm like, what the hell is that? <laughs> and then what comes out of that is all the witnesses, you know, one saying a purple PT cruiser, the other one saying a comet, and what? They all sound all different. It doesn't sound like a Ford Focus. What is going on here? <laughs> it's just like, what a case, right? talk to any of those folks because of the gag order in place. We'll, uh, again, have more for you coming up at 6 as we wait to find out the latest ruling here from the judge on whether all these charges against Richard Allen should be dropped. Imagine if she's like, yep, okay, I agree. Out you go. <laughs> Everyone's still on the floor. What? Wow. So now, again, the trial is supposed to start on... I'm going to bring up the document now, and then we're done for today with our bullet points, okay? Because we're trying to keep it short and sweet. So that it's not overwhelming because I've been quite overwhelmed <laughs> for a few days. Just with like, what, what, where, who? Eavesdropping everywhere. <laughs> what did you see? What were they wearing? Who did you see? Who said what? Who, who got thrown out? And they did what now? <laughs> There's like videos floating around of that as well. Oh no, it's, 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 it's a little bit embarrassing here. Okay, so let's quickly uh, look at the document that MB Inc. just sent. Which says, state's motion for leave to amend charging information. Okay. So, 
yeah, Rexy says the judge is the one who has created this mess. Like, literally, who is in control here, right? Like, what is going on? So, state's motion, it's only two pages. Comes now, the state, this is about the amended charges. That's why this document's important. Now, this was filed when? Because McLean likes to file at night. <laughs> 18th, okay, of the first at 10.30 a.m. You're filing at the, okay, the court clerk filing it then. Okay, cool, cool. While you in, he always likes to do this, isn't it? Like, while, it was about the amended charges, but it's like, while you're in it. Like, while the Supreme Court of Indiana hearing was happening, he's like, ah, let me file additional charges. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> okay. Comes now the state of Indiana by prosecuting attorney Nicholas C. McClellan and hereby respectfully asks the court for leave to amend the charging information filed in this cause on October 28th, 2022. And in support, therefore, does appear on October 28th of 2022, the state filed a charging information al alleging these offenses, murder as outlined in count one and murder as outlined in count two. The defendant was arrested on October 26th of 2022 by a detective with Carroll County Sheriff's Department. The probable cause affidavit executed by then detective, now Sheriff Tony Liggett. <laughs> wow, he's just putting it out there just like that for us, right, right before the election. <laughs> okay, yeah, Stephen like McClellan is working hard. It reminds me a bit of Jason, you know, in the, like the defense attorney. This is now a prosecutor. But Jason from the Daniel Howard trial, McClellan reminds me of him. <laughs> so the probable cause affidavit executed by then detective, now Sheriff Tony Liggett and filed by the state on October 28th of 2022 identifies acts of murder on or about February 13th of 2017. The discovery in this cause also revolves around acts of murder occurring in Carroll County on that date. The charging information and the probable cause in this matter reflect the charge of murder under IC 3542 1-12, that's the code I was talking about earlier, commonly referred to as felony murder. Specifically that Richard Allen did kidnap victim 1 and victim 2 by force and in the process of committing that felony, both victim 1 and victim 2 were murdered. Which could still allude to, are there going to be more arrests or not, or you know what I mean. Anyway, doesn't have to be taken literally like that. It could just be one suspect, this guy, Lone Wolf, if that's their theory. But Mr. McClelland over here himself said that he doesn't want the probable cause affidavit to be released to the public because he believes that there'll be more arrests. So I still ask myself, where are the more arrests? By the way, Superintendent Doug Carter was in the courtroom and for Todd Click, an investigator, to say all the things he was saying while, you know, all those detectives are staring back at him, that's pretty brave, right? He's pretty confident in what he's saying. You know what I mean? So anyway, I'm just thinking of Doug Carter now because it's also like tentacles, many tentacles, and you want to know what we know, and one day you will. <laughs> yeah, we still want to know. Okay, we'll wait for the trial. So then the state hereby moves to... Uh, did I say it? Did I say it all? Wait. Yes. The state hereby moves to amend the charging information and to add additional counts, which include murder under the code 3542-1-1. One. Okay, okay, that's the one I was looking up, but they're going to tell us what it is now. Because not like that on my case quite yet. Uh, for both victim one and victim two, along with kidnapping under IC 3542-3-2A and the other one. But they, they, they dismissed those kidnapping charges and amended the murder charges. The state is asking the court for leave to file these amended charges because the charges more accurately aligns with the charging information with the cause of discovery and probable cause affidavit. Because of the clarity of the discovery and probable cause affidavit, the defendant has been on notice since the beginning of this case. That this amendment does not prejudice the defendant's substantial rights. That the trial for this matter is, <laughs> it's not nine months away anymore, sir. It's not nine months away anymore. When did he write this? Oh, MB Inc. I'm like nine months away. Okay, so those are the codes that's what was dropped. This, this, I'm like, what? Just confused for a second. Eh? 18-1. We're in March. <laughs> okay. I just got such a fright. I'm like, why is he saying nine months away? Okay. My heart nearly jumped out of my chest. Yeah. Okay. He doesn't think it's nine months away. He knows it's 54 days away. But those are the charges he wanted changed. It's now being changed. No more kidnapping. Now it's those murder charges according to those codes. I must actually just go on to my case. Hold on. If you don't know, you can go to my case, Indiana, and then you can type in last name, Alan. Okay. First name. I just want to see if the codes match what he wanted here, because when I looked this morning, I don't think they did. Um, the purple one says they just want someone convicted. They don't care if it's the right person. That's the impression we're getting, which is sad. Don't you think? 
you know, many people feel that way and it's sad. So, okay, hold on one second. I just quickly want to go here. Okay, so now the code on, I can actually show you. Can I bring it over here? Let's look if it's been updated. This is from my case, which is uh, public.courts.indiana.gov my case, okay? Right, so here's the code, Carol Circuit murder, yes, pending active case. 3542 1 12 and 45 and number two is also. So it's all like that now. It's all the same code. It's listed four times. So it's murder while kidnapping, as we've gone over before. So we'll just uh, yeah see what happens next. I don't know why that makes it easier to prosecute. I would think it would be the other way around, you know, that, that they would want the kidnapping charges to prove that he's the bridge guy because they believe that, right? He's the bridge guy. That's the guy. He's the one that kidnapped them. He's the one with the gun. If they believe that, one would think that they would go with the kidnapping charges as the predominant ones, but no, they're going kind of the other way around. So either way, the trial is going to be very interesting. Oh my goodness. 54 days away. They haven't said anything about cameras, but do you think, <laughs> do you think at this point with the way that things have gone, that they're actually going to allow cameras in the courtroom not even just delayed coverage but like live streaming like i never see that happening in this case i don't see it i don't even know if we'll get audio only it'll probably be like nothing which really sucks because it really especially a case like this it's got so much i don't know chaos secrecy questions red flags it really should just be transparent it should right mara says gold needs to go but she won't yeah <laughs> I mean, she said it a few times now, right? She's like, nope, not going, deny it. <laughs> deny, deny it, and deny it. And snapping at people. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, Sorry, the comments are flying here. BH says she didn't give them the kidnapping charges that they wanted. Exactly. She didn't give McClellan the kidnapping charges that they wanted. Rather, he amended and tweaked. And it's also of that statute limitation that we looked at in that presentation. Janet says, no cameras, only sketches. <laughs> and even word, like, remember the Lori Vello trial? We got audio only and some sketches. I don't even know if we're going to get that in this trial. Yes, yeah, Sherry says, no, G, no coverage. Uh, that's sad. I think of all cases, this one should really be for all the world to see. So this all like, the world is watching. Yeah, the world is watching about all the shenanigans leading up to the trial. But you know what? We can't say that anymore once the trial starts. No one will be watching. <laughs> that's horrible. So... Okay, that's what I have for you for today. I want to keep it nice and short and sweet as possible. I hope it made sense to you. Um, as I say, Bob Motta from Defense Diary, uh, Diaries, uh, Truth and Transparency. Those two I've listened to the most. Of course, the murder sheet was also there. So you could, if you wanted to listen to them as well, um, just to hear what happened in the courtroom, right? And there's more. Of course, there's more people as well. And that's all um, Rick Snay, who was, you know, um, dismissed from the courtroom. He's also talked about what happened there and his experience with it. So you can listen to all of that if you want to. If you don't want to, well, that was the point of today's episode for you. <laughs> Just to bring you bullet point summaries. What do we need to know? What's next? So what's next? May 1st, we have to see, well, Judge Gull, what are you deciding? And then May 13th is like, oh, damn, trial day. Tri jury selection starts. It's hard to believe. We already thought it's hard to believe that the January trial would start and we were right. <laughs> So much happened. Remember, this trial was supposed to start on January 12th, I think it was. Yeah, no. Then McClellan pulled a few stunts and it delayed things up to now. Set for October. Now it's brought back to May 13th. Let's see. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate it. Again, happy birthday to Peniel. Thank you so much for being here. I can't wait to read your comments. Please let me know what you think. You know, it's just unbelievable what's going on in this case. I will keep you posted. I'm following all the stuff in this this delphi debacle i'm following it all okay and we're going to report on it and we're going to watch what we can watch until we can't watch anymore and then still then i'm going to be <laughs> eavesdropping <laughs> and listening to other people's crib notes and trying to make sense of it all and i really hope that they they can be a fair trial i just don't think they can be but let's see what happens thank you so much everyone thank you mods see you again very soon bye